Yeah. Okay, fine. Um, what do we have here? Share the screen to the this week's Torah portion. So this week's Torah portion, it happens to be Leviticus. It's in the middle of Leviticus chapter 23, in the middle of the portion, talks about the, 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 the holidays, the introductory paragraph, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I'm reading Leviticus chapter 23, verse two, speak to the children of Israel and send to them the Lord's appointed holy days that you shall designate as holy occasions. These are my appointed holy days. And we go through Shabbat, we go through Passover, and then the offerings of Passover. Okay, now after Passover, we get to verse nine. What does verse nine say? Speak to, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, then verse 10, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come to the land that which I am giving you and you reap its harvest, you shall bring to the Kohen an Omer of, of the beginning of the year reaping. So a certain measurement called the Omer you have to bring to the priests. And we sh he shall wave the Omer before the Lord so that it will be accept acceptable for you. The Kohen shall wave it on the day after the rest day, literally the day after Shabbat. Now, without getting into the history, there's a whole blow up, blow up over here where the traditional view is the day after the rest day means the day after Passover, because we just mentioned Passover. Then there were people who rejected the oral Torah, the Sadducees, they said it's the day after Shabbos, it's Sunday, we're not gonna get into it right now. Bottom line is, the, the tradition is after the day after Passover, you bring an omer, a certain small measurement of grain to the priest, and, 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 and uh, then you bring other offerings together. Verse 12 and 13 is the other offerings that come along with the omer. Not important for us right this second. Verse 14 is the key. Um, you shall not eat bread of flour made from parched grain or fresh grain until this very day, until you bring God's sacrifice. This is an eternal statue throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. Okay? So basically it says that you cannot eat any new grain in any form as bread or as parched grain. People just eat the kernels, right? What do you say in Russian? It's a semichkes or seeds, a semichkes, but kernels. You get the point. The point here is you can't eat it in any form until they bring the offering to God on the second day of Passover. And then you have the mitzvah of counting the counting the Omer, verse 15, and you shall count for yourselves from the morrow of the, day, or the rest day, from the day that you bring the Omer as a wave offering, seven weeks, they shall be complete. So that is the, these are the verses that we're going to think about. Now there's a very interesting uh, disagreement. The disagreement is where does this mitzvah apply? And it's significant because does the, really, the question is, does it apply outside of Israel? Am I allowed to go to the bakery in America the day before the second day of Passover? Am I allowed to buy new flour? Again, assuming that this flour is the new flour from this year, which is another discussion. It may not be from this year, just from a few months ago, just from a few weeks ago. But let's leave that alone. Assuming I know this grain is new. Am I allowed to use it, or do I have to wait for the second day of Passover? In other words, does this prohibition called chadash, called new, does the prohibition of chadash apply only in Israel, or does it apply throughout the entire world, wherever Jewish people will live? So it's a practical question with a practical ramification. Now, the interesting thing here is that you have a disagreement. Why is there a disagreement? Because it's not a simple matter. Because the verse says one thing. But the way we understand these types of mitzvot would tell us something else. So we end up with a disagreement. And Rashi is kind enough to, we don't have to go to the Talmud, Rashi opens up and tells us what, that is a disagreement, and, and uh, he tells us what the opinions believe. And the essay that we're going to discuss from the Rebbe is analyzing this, this disagreement. But the analyzing from the halachic perspective, from the legal perspective, and then what is fascinating, it also analyzes it from the psychological, spiritual perspective. And that's why I'm so excited because you have both elements. We may do both elements today, may not. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see how it plays out. But before we even get to the Rebbe's essay, so far we read the verse. Now we're going to go to the next level, the sages of the Talmud, how they explain it. But like I said, instead of going to the Talmud, I'm going to go to, my, to Rashi, who is uh, 
going to do the work for us. So here the problem, let's look at verse 14 again. You shall not eat bread or flour made from the parched grain or fresh grain until this very day. Until you bring the God sacrifice. This is an eternal statute throughout your generations. Here's the key phrase. In all your dwelling places. The end of verse 14. Bechol Moshevotechem. Literally, wherever you settle. In all your dwelling places. So, if you read this, sounds like everywhere. If you happen to live in old Greenwich, you're in. You cannot eat the first grain. Even the grain that grew in Greenwich, you cannot eat it until second day of Passover. That is what that is what it says. The verse seems to say. Rashi says, no, no, there's a disagreement. And the sages disagree about the meaning of this. And part of what the Rebbe is going to do is try to explain why is there a disagreement. Isn't it clear? But we're going to explain why there's a disagreement. And then we're also going to explain, like I said, the psychological ramification and the spiritual ramification. So we'll look at Rashi. In all your dwelling places, the sages of Israel, this is also going to be a point that Rebbe is going to make. This is a very unusual expression from um, Rashi. Or the town, Rashi would always say this, um, Rabbi Seinu, our teachers. He almost never, he never refers to them as Chachma Yisrael, the sages of Israel. Here it's, uh, it's unique. So obviously there's a reason, but we don't know the reason yet. So the sages of Israel differ concerning this. Differ is a, is a bad word. Nechleku means they divide. Oh, I guess differ is okay. There's a machloka, there's a disagreement. The sages of Israel disagreeing, disagree concerning this matter. Some learned from here that the prohibition of eating the new crop before the Omer applies even outside the land of Israel, right? That's what you would think. You would think, B'chol Moshevotechem, translated, in all your dwelling places, right? So that would mean wherever you live, wherever you live is wherever you live, outside of Israel as well. So even outside of Israel, you cannot eat of the new fruit, of the new grain, until either they bring the Omer offering, but likely you don't know exactly what time they brought it, so till the next day, till the day after the 16th of Nisan, the second day of Passover. That's one opinion. While others say that this phrase comes only to teach us that they were commanded regarding the new crop only after possession and settlement, after they conquered and, 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 and apportioned the land. This is from Kiddushin from the tractate in Talmud called Kiddushin. What is the second opinion saying? Second opinion is saying, no, this mitzvah, this commandment has, to, has nothing, it does not apply outside of Israel. It applies exclusively in Israel. What are you going to do with the high, with the verse, the end of verse 14 that says, in all your dwelling places, which could imply you have to, anywhere you will dwell? She says, no, that's not what the verse means. The verse is saying as follows. The verse is trying to tell you something else. What the verse is trying to tell you is that when they entered Israel, they were still allowed to eat of the first grain. The mitzvah did not apply. Because it took seven years for them to conquer Israel. It took them seven years to divide the land of Israel. So the individual farmer did not get his permanent settlement in the land of Israel until 14 years after the Jewish people were going to enter Israel. So the sages say, the second group of sages, when the verse says, in wherever you settle, they're telling you that this mitzvah is only triggered once you settle, once the Jewish people settled in Israel. But before the Jewish people settled in Israel, it does not apply. But outside of Israel, no, it does not. It does not apply outside of Israel. So these are the two opinions. Seems like a simple Rashi. As we will see, this Rashi is totally complicated, layers and layers of complication. Um, we're going to give the interpretation. We'll, 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 we'll go along with the ride with the Rebbe giving us the interpretation. And like I said, well, then we'll get to the spiritual interpretation. But before we even go into the specifics of what the Rebbe is going to say, I ask you a question. Which one do you think... If you want to share your opinion, either you could open your mic or you can um, write it on the chat or whatever else you want to do or, or, or just think to your mind. Which opinion do you think is the more straightforward, more convincing, right? The first opinion says, in all your dwelling places means everywhere. That's opinion one. Opinion number two, in all your dwelling places, wherever you dwell, wherever you settle, it applies only in Israel. So why are you saying in all your dwelling places? It means after you dwell, after you got the, the, the portion, the, the, you settled in the portion of the land. If I asked you, and I gave you these two, two choices, which one would you tell me is more convincing? If anybody wants to volunteer. I think the first one is more, more straightforward because- it Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry, my, my sound is off. Could you repeat? 
Um, no, you were okay. I just, my sound was off. Um, yeah, I was just saying that it appears to be the first is more straightforward because it doesn't say specifically Israel, it's just whatever you dwell in places. However, in Greenwich, Connecticut, we shouldn't be concerned because the crop is not ready yet. Right. But if you go to, uh, I don't know, Arizona, I don't know where they go. Okay, so you got me there. But if you go somewhere else, and anywhere in the world, and I would say, you said it doesn't say Israel, that's a negative proof. I would say it's a positive proof. It says in all, is it all, all? All is expansive in all your dwelling places. That would seem to be everywhere. So I agree with you. And Zina, if you disagree, let us know. Otherwise, we're gonna take the we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna take. Yeah, the, I am with you. I am with you. Us. Okay, unanimous, unanimous. We all agree that the first one is much more straightforward. If you stop the guy on the street and say, "Here are the two interpretations of Rashi of, of the sages. Which one is more straightforward? In all your dwelling places. In all your dwelling places. Okay, okay. So this is this is this is the, this is this is this is the basics. Now, what did the Rebbe teach us to do? So a little bit of history. I think we discussed it, but we'll, but, but we'll give some history. Rashi is a commentator. Rashi has many layers of commentary on him. I have a book at home with 11 commentators on Rashi. But the Rebbe started a new way to think about Rashi. And it started in 1964, after the passing of his mother, after his mother passed away um, in 1964, every Shabbat the Rebbe would teach a Rashi and delve in in great depth. And then over the years, it accumulated many, many, many essays on Rashi. And not only do we have many essays on Rashi, but then what accumulates is general rules of how to study Rashi. And the Rebbe proves it because of the consistency. That's what you see across a wide variety of Rashis. So the Rebbe really um, created a new way to think about, a new way to study Rashi, new tools to analyze Rashi. And I'm gonna give you two tools that, 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 um, that apply to all Rashis and we're gonna to try to figure out how it applies here. Number one, when Rashi brings two, well, I'll give you three rules, but two rules, depending on how you count it. When Rashi brings, sometimes Rashi brings one interpretation. Okay, he brings one interpretation is one interpretation. When Rashi brings two interpretations, um, why does he bring two? So when Rashi brings two, the first one is superior, but it's imperfect. There's one problem with the first interpretation. So we bring the second interpretation, which solves the problem of the first interpretation, but creates a bigger problem. So in the final analysis, if you have two, the first one is better, but it's imperfect. But the second one answers the imperfection of the first, but creates other problems. So in general, you would say when Rashi brings two interpretations, the first one is the better one. Now I would say, oh, beautiful. Look, Rashi put two interpretations. And Rashi said, and we all agree, all three of us agree that the first one is more straightforward. So everything is fine. Let's go home. It's 1028. We can go home. No, 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 no. It's actually much more complicated than that. Why is that? So what one of the other rules that I've approved from Rashi is that sometimes, this is a case in point, but it's not the only case in point. Sometimes Rashi would say, there's a disagreement. Opinion A says A, opinion B says B. Usually he does not do that. Rashi is concise. He wants to save space on the paper. Usually Rashi says one opinion. And then he says, the yes, and others say. So when you start reading the Rashi, you have no idea that there's going to be a second opinion. Only when you finish the first do you learn about the second. That's what Rashi does in vast majority of the cases, probably over 90%, maybe over 95%. That he lists one. And then he says, oh, and some say there are others. But then there's a few Rashis like our Rashi. We're at the outset, Rashi says, ladies and gentlemen, there's a disagreement. What some say and some say, that's what Rashi's doing over here, right? Rashi says, um, the sages of Israel cons differ concerning this, this period. There is a disagreement, newsflash. And now I'll tell you, some learn this and some learn that. Why does Rashi give this introduction here? He doesn't give it in the vast majority of the cases. The vast majority of cases, Rashi gives an interpretation. And when he's done the first interpretation, which is the primary interpretation, then he says, oh, by the way, there's another interpretation. It's not what he does now. So the Rebbe proves that in many other cases also, in all those cases, or a lot of those cases, that whenever Rashi starts and says there's a disagreement, it's because according to Rashi, these two opinions are equal. One is not superior to the other. So now Rashi has, is stuck. If one is not superior to the other, which one are you going to write first? You can't write both. 
So what he does is he starts, there's a disagreement. By notifying you that there's a disagreement, he doesn't want that the first opinion, you should be biased toward the first opinion, right? In the beginning, he tells you, ladies and gentlemen, there are two. So understand before you even start reading, they are equal. So what did, what did we just get to? We just get to that according to the Rebbe's interpretation of Rashi, the first statement, the sages of Israel differ concerning this means that Rashi says both opinions are the same. One is not more straightforward than the next. And we have a problem. Why not? Doesn't the simple reading of the verse that we had three out of three, we had a pretty good uh, sample here. We had three of the three, all of us agreed unanimously, which almost never happens. <laughs> Three Jews agreeing on one thing. We all agree that the first interpretation seems to be much closer to the simple meaning. In all your dwelling places means in all your dwelling places all over Israel. It doesn't mean in Israel after you dwell, after you settle. That seems much more, much more, much more uh, far-fetched. So I would expect the first one to be the first one. No, but Rashi comes in and says, there's a disagreement. If there's a disagreement, um, Rashi is telling you they're the same. So the first one, and it has to be a problem with the first one, and we're going to end up, but they're not only are the same, they're exactly the same. The same problem that the first presents, number two presents the same problem. So this is where we're getting. Now, we could have read all this inside in the essay. I'm going to skip to, the, to all this part. I'm going to try to skip and try to get straight to the point, explaining why these two opinions are equal. And then maybe next week we'll we'll, go, we'll look at the psychological, spiritual, uh, psycho I would say psychological, psychological explanation of this uh, disagreement. But I we first want to deal with this bigger problem: Why does Rashi treat seem to treat these two interpretations equal? That what interpretation number one that in all your dwelling places applies everywhere, and interpretation number two that in all your dwelling places applies specifically in Israel. How could they be the same? Isn't the first one so much more closer to the simple meaning? So that's what we have to deal with. Okay, ready to jump in? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're gonna read it inside because I don't want to make I, I don't want to make a I don't want to make a I don't want to make a mistake I don't want to miss a subtle point here. But I'm just gonna give you what from memory uh, make a confession I should have read the whole essay before I didn't but I just remember the main points from memory. So I'll give you the main problem here. The main problem is that this first interpretation goes against a set established rule that Rashi establishes elsewhere. Rashi elsewhere establishes that there are two types of commandments. There is a type of commandment that applies to a person, to the body. And then there's a type of a commandment that applies not to the person, but to the land. For example, a person should eat matzah. That applies to the person. Then there's a mitzvah next week, the sabbatical, let the land rest in the seventh year. That's a mitzvah that applies to the land. Says Rashi, a general rule, every mitzvah that applies to the body applies in every single place, right? There's no verse that says, oh, you have to eat matzah, not only in Israel, but wherever you dwell, even in Greenwich. No such verse. You don't need a verse like that. Why not? Because if the language of the, of, the, of, the, of the sages, if it's chovat haguf, if it's an obligation upon the person, if it's an obligation upon the body, then it makes no difference where the body is. The obligation is upon me. My location is irrelevant. However, there's a class of commandments, not just one command, but many commandments that apply to the land. You should have to plow the land, how to see the land, not to mix seeds, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole class of land, of, of mitzvah that we call chovat karka, the obligation is upon the land, not upon a person. Of course, of course, uh, mitzvahs for the person. You should not work the land when the land is supposed to rest. Yes, but that's a result. The mitzvah is the land should rest. You just are not supposed to interfere with the rest of the land. The rest, meaning the resting of the land. So if it's a mitzvah that applies to land, the rule is it applies only in Israel. Because the land is a big distinction between the land in Israel and the land outside of Israel. So this is the general rule. This is where we come. This is the starting point, and that's a very logical starting point. That the mitzvah upon a person is everywhere in all locations. A mitzvah upon the land is specifically in Israel. By that analysis, 
when you come to this mitzvah and you read that you're not allowed to eat from the new grain. The new grain is a mitzvah of the land. Ah, so now our bias, now we should say one second. This maybe should apply only in Israel to be consistent with the rule that a mitzvah upon the land is only in Israel. See what I'm saying? You see that that's an la extra layer of complication. Now we're going to read the essay inside and see why, give the full background of this discussion and see why both, both, both interpretations suffer from the same problem and that's why they are equal. But I just wanted to introduce this concept to just to give us a little bit of a background about the distinction between a mitzvah upon the body, a person, which is then understood to be everywhere, and then the mitzvah upon the land, which is... Um, so understood to be only in Israel. And if this mitzvah applies everywhere, it would be a break with the rule. It's possible. First interpretation says it applies everywhere. So it's possible. There's not, nothing wrong. The Torah can make an exception. Is, they, they, we don't, we don't, there are allowed to be exceptions, but it's a departure from the general rule, if you see what I'm saying. So that's my way of introduction. Let's jump in. Let's read it. Let's read it carefully. Let's see how far we go. Um, See what happens. So I'm going to share the screen because thank God they translated this in English, into English. Okay. So I skipped the first two sections, which were the whole background about the rules of Rashi and how usually the first interpretation is superior, but in this case, it's not. Why not? Because Rashi gives the introduction saying that there's a dispute amongst the sages of Israel, which tells us that he's indicating that they're equal. And why does he bring one first? Because you have to bring one first, because there's no choice. You're, uh, you're going to have to say one first. So to, to, to diffuse the, the, the assumption that the first one is better, which is what Rashi usually does, he says, no, 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 there's a disagreement. Okay, fine. That was, that's, that's what we accomplished in the first two sections. Now we'll go to section number three. The explanation. Regarding the prohibition to castrate any animal, wild or domesticated, previously in our Parsha, the Torah says, and in your land, you shall not do so. Okay, now we're getting a little complicated. There's a mitzvah, prohibition to castrate an animal. Now, the problem is castrate an animal would be, it seems to be a mitzvah for the body. It's the person, it's the animal. It doesn't matter where it is. The problem is that the ver verse says, in your land, you shall not do so. So Rashi has to address in your land. Does it apply in the land or does it apply everywhere? So here's what Rashi says. The Torah said, Rashi explains, the Torah says in your land to include all species found in your land. In other words, when the verse says you cannot castrate an animal in all your land, Rashi rejects the notion that in all your land, in your land means only in Israel. It can't be only in Israel because the mitzvah, not the castrate, the animal, the animal doesn't matter where the animal is because, again, it's an obligation upon the body. So Rashi says, no, 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 no. In your land, it doesn't mean in your land that it only applies in your land. In your land means this encompasses any species of animal in your land. It's not the most straightforward interpretation, but Rashi has no choice. Why does Rashi have no choice? Because we know a mitzvah on the body should apply everywhere. So this is what Rashi is going to say. For we cannot suggest that Torah commands us to refrain from castrating animals only in the land of Israel. After all, castration is a personal obligation, not the best translation, but it's upon the body. And all personal, personal obligations apply in Israel and outside Israel. I'm scrolling down to footnote 13, they may give a better translation. In the original Hebrew, an obligation placed upon the person, meaning the body. Okay, so what do we say? Forget about before we get to our parsha, before we get to the question of the Omer. We have a verse that says, do not castrate animals in, the land, in your land. Rashi won't even consider the notion that in your land means that it's only in Israel. Why not? How could that be? We have not to castrate animals upon the animal. Animal, a mitzvah upon the animal. I, I, may, I may be making a mistake. I would say it's a mitzvah upon the person. I am not allowed to castrate. It's a mitzvah upon the person. If it's a, whatever the case is on the animal, on the person, I'm probably, it's probably about the person. But the bottom line is it's not about, nothing to do with the land. There's no mitzvah of land. There's no land involved. If there's no land involved, it's upon the person or the body, either the body, I think it's the body of the person. But in any case, it certainly does not apply to the land. And therefore, Rashi won't even consider as an option that in your land means in the land of Israel. From here, from here we, we see 
mistake. From here we see that the principle any personal obligation applies in Israel and outside of Israel is so strong that even when expounding the phrase in your land according to Pshat, the simple meaning, the simple semantic translation is relinquished in order not to contradict this principle. In other words, Rashi is so married to this concept that if it's about the person, it's universe, it's everywhere. If it's upon the land, it's in Israel, that Rashi won't even consider saying anything else. And when the Torah says, do not castrate a land, animal in your land, Rashi says it doesn't mean in your land, it doesn't mean in Israel, it means everywhere. And in your land means that the prohibition encompasses every type of animal. I'm gonna skip the brackets. Now, the same approach must be used when applying the second half of the principle, right? The first half of the principle was that anything that's upon the body is, applies everywhere. Now, what about the second part of the principle? Anything which is upon the land applies in Israel, only in Israel, right? That's our discussion. Thus, the same approach must be used when applying the second half of the principle that an obligation associated with land only applies in Israel. This principle must be applied universally in Torah when expounding the pshat, even if in doing so changes the semantic meaning of a word, okay? So now let's go back to, for a second, let's go back to, for a second, let's go back to the Rashi. I'm skipping, we go back to the Rashi. What does Rashi say? The first interpretation means that the prohibition of eating new crop applies even outside of Israel, right? The first interpretation, we all agreed it's a simple interpretation. The verse says in all your settlements, it means everywhere. But what the Rebbe says, according to Rashi himself, we can't do that. We can't say that that's what the verse means because we have a premise and the premise is logical. And the logical premise is that if it applies to land, it is just in Israel. So what we thought was so straightforward now is a little bit downgraded because we have a potential problem of how does this, uh, consi how does this, how is this consistent with the overall principle? So that is point number one. We're not finished making the point. We still have to show how they're equal and show, finish, further elaborate. I just have to apologize and take a break, break for a minute because the battery is very almost dead. I would have to pause it and then go upstairs and then we'll continue. So I need about 60 seconds. So thank you for your patience. It's a very serious question. Why is this so complicated? Right? Essentially, that is in this question. Why is it so complicated? Why can't the verse just say what it wants to say in Israel or out of Israel? Why do you have to go in circles and be so vague? So, so the answer is that we will see later that the Torah wants to include both possibilities. Because even though the law is only going to follow one, but the psychological lesson, we could do both. And the Torah, if the Torah told you, oh, it only applies in Israel, and it all, or the Torah, tell, the Torah would tell you it only applies outside of Israel, then you would know what to do. But you would miss the much deeper analysis that there's two ways to look at this. There's two ways to think about how to achieve the goals the Torah is trying to achieve with this mitzvah. And both goals are, and both ways are legitimate. Different people would respond to different stimuli. And that's why the Torah writes it vague and complicated and giving space for the disagreement. So if you just look at this as law, then it's, it's, it's a failure. Just tell us what to do. Don't drive us crazy. But if it's not just what to do, it's also what to do, but it's also on a much deeper level, what's the spiritual meaning? Oh, then the complication is beautiful because the complication, what it does is it is allows for more space for different opinions and that accommodates different types of people. And you're going to see there's two dramatically different ways how to think about achieving the goal that the Torah wants to achieve through this mitzvah. But for that, we're going to have to be a little patient. I apologize. And then you said something about always being right. So the guy once told me, he says, I'm never wrong. <laughs> once I thought I was wrong, but I was wrong. <laughs> How was that? Yeah. Okay, let's do. A, let's make a little bit more progress, and then we'll uh, and then we'll 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 break for next. We'll continue. We'll pick up the spiritual side next week. It's just going to be too much for now. But let's let's just make a little bit more progress on the argument here.
the problem with the first interpretation to say that it applies everywhere, which is the simple interpretation of the verse. How much will take in all your settlement? But it's a problem here. There's no other model for a mitzvah that it applies to the land and it applies throughout the world. There's no such mitzvah. If this is the mitzvah, this may be, according to some opinions, it is. But if it may, if it, if it will be, it will be the only one. There's no other mitzvah in this context. So the same approach must be used. Okay, similarly in our context, we're going to bring it all home. Rashi is not content. I'm reading the third paragraph. Similarly in our context, Rashi is not content with the interpretation that chadash, the new uh, grain, the prohibition of eating new bra- grain, applies outside Israel. Since this interpretation contravenes the principle and obligation associated with land that only applies in Israel. Therefore, he brings another interpretation to the phrase, in all your dwelling places, namely after possession and settlement. Although this interpretation does not align well semantically with the words in all your dwelling places, it does not conflict with the principle discussed above, similar to the explanation explanation mentioned above on on the words, and in your land you shall not do so. So in other words, we're basically going to say like this. Each interpretation has an advantage. The advantage of the first interpretation that says, in all your dwelling places means all side, all, um, um, all over, all on the entire world, wherever you live, also including outside of Israel. The advantage of that interpretation is clear, but it's semantic. The words of the verse lean in that direction. So it has a semantic advantage. But then the, the, the advantage of the second interpretation, which is that in all your dwelling places applies only in Israel. And in all your dwelling places means that it applies only once you dwell 14 years after the Jewish people enter the land of Israel. What is the advantage of that interpretation? Not a semantic advantage, but an advantage is that it's neat. It's, it's consistent with the general rule that commandments concerning land apply only in Israel. So now we have two. Each one has its own advantage. What we're going to try to set out to do now is to say that these two advantages are equal. The semantic advantage is not better than the other advantage. The other advantage that it's part of the principle is not better than the semantic one. We want to say that it's equal. If it's equal, we understand why Rashi brings them both, does not mention the first one first, and actually gives an introduction saying, well, he mentions the first one first, but only after introducing the concept and saying, we have a dispute between both sages. So that's what we're setting out to do. But so far, even if we stop right now, we understand that the first one that looked so appealing in the beginning has a serious problem. The problem is not the, the words. The problem is we, we, it's, it, just, I, I, it just breaks the model. The model doesn't, it, it's inconsistent with the general rule. Now, if you have another five minutes, we'll try perhaps to show how both interpretations, both problems are the same. In other words, it gives us, they, they, they both are this, leads, they're both on the same level. So let's see if we can do this. In other words, we'll read it inside. We'll read it inside, and then we'll cut it. We'll call it a day. But what, what the Rebbe is going to say is both the first problem and the second problem is an exception. It's either an exception to the semantic or it's expe- an exception to the rule. So therefore, they're both equal. You have to say that this is an exception. So that's the problem here. So let's read that one more part, one more section inside, and then we'll break. I'll we'll come back next week, and we'll get to the psychological reason. I won't take more than three minutes or four minutes to review the Rashi, and then we'll go straight to the to the to the spiritual inter- interpretation. So here we go. Let us go to um, share the screen. Number five. We'll do from five to six. So it's another three, four paragraphs. Uh, no, we, we're up to number four. We're up to number four, which is just three paragraphs. Okay. Yeah, four. This interpretation, meaning the second interpretation, that in all your settlements means after we settle, that a mitzvah applies everywhere, is also not so smooth. However, also not so small, however. And therefore, Rashi also cites the interpretation that that from here, some derive that the law of Chadash applies also outside land of Israel. In other words, the second interpretation is a problem, is also, also has a problem, and therefore we have the first interpretation. For the Torah says in all your dwelling places, concerning many other mitzvot, and in all the other instances there, where this is said, the intent is that the obligation applies outside of Israel. Okay, So we have one rule that says anything that applies to land is only of is- in Israel. 
Okay. We have another rule that says every time throughout the entire Torah, whenever the Torah says in all your dwelling places, it applies only in Israel. So we have two rules. This verse is an exception. You have to break one of those rules. And therefore, they're both equal because they're both going against the consistent rule. It emerges that to interpret the phrase in all your dwelling places as meaning after possession and settlement is to make an exception as to how this phrase is understood in all other places in the Torah. Therefore, Rashi also brings the first interpretation. On this basis, we can understand how these two interpretations are equally valid within Pshat, the same level. But the same highlight that is the in all your dwelling places is exceptional. Israel is an exception to the rule. Also concerning, also according to Pshat as mentioned, that an obligation associated with land only applies in Israel. According to the second interpretation, the meaning of the phrase in all your dwelling places diverges from its meaning in all other places in the Torah, where it means in all your inhabitant, inhabited places, even outside of Israel. So in other words, to read this verse, you have to make an exception. Either it's against the word that everywhere in the Torah, when the Torah says, in all your dwelling places, it means in Israel. And the second interpretation says it means outside of Israel, or it's against the meaning. In other words, the meaning of where this, of, 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 of the meaning everywhere, where everywhere, if something is an obligation on the person, I'm sorry, something's an obligation of the land, it applies everywhere. So to say it applies only in Israel is an exception to that rule. So, so it's either the word or the meaning. Bottom line is we have a verse, problematic, because for the first time, a mitzvah concerning land uses words that imply that it is only, that it is all over, even outside of Israel. So something has to break. Either you say the second interpretation, no, 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 you're misreading, it applies only in Israel. Or you say it applies everywhere, and it's an exception to the, to the general rule that a mitzvah that applies to the land is only in Israel. So in that same, in that in, 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 in that sense, this verse is an exception. And both both interpretations are going to have to contend with that. So what are we left with? Two valid interpretations. Now that Eva is going to say for next week, just a cliffhanger. If they're both valid. Why do some sages say this way and some sages say that way? In other words, what's the deeper disagreement? Ah, for that, they're the sages of Israel, which I alluded to before, is a very unusual expression. Because here, you need wisdom. You need wisdom to, to figure out what the purpose of the mitzvah is. And you need wisdom of the human soul of how you're trying to impact the human being to be susceptible to the message of the purpose of the mitzvah. And if it's evaluating people, there's different, there's different opinions. And you need sages to use their judgments. And the answer is going to be that both the two valid ways of, of, of imparting this message, of imparting this message as we will speak and as we will elaborate next week. So in some sense, this week is the lead up, explaining to us why both opinions are equal. And now we're going to move on. And then the second part is going to be uh, the deeper spiritual significance. And hopefully the second part makes the first part more meaningful. So that's the story in short, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining.